This is chapter 4, Probability. Section 4.1 is Statistical and Critical Thinking. We start off with a few new vocabulary words that we should know. First one that we have is the probability of an event refers to the likelihood that the event will occur. The probability of event A is represented by P, and then in parentheses is A, and is a value between 0 and 1. Outcomes are the different ways an event can occur. Sample space is the probability experiment, is the collection of all possible outcomes. An event is an, a, any collection of outcomes from a probability experiment. And then simple events is an outcome or an event so that cannot be further broken down into simpler components. So the first example that we have is a simple event. It says the probability experiment consists of sampling M&M &M colors. Identify the outcomes of the experiment. And so if you think about all the colors of M&Ms, we have red, blue, yellow, orange, brown, and green. In these outcomes, I'm going to go ahead and put some braces around them. Determine the sample space. Our sample space here is 6. The reason why is because there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different colors that we have. Part C says define the event of not selecting red, blue, or green. This event, I'm going to call it E, would be yellow orange and brown and again I will go ahead and put braces around these for this event. Some notation is listed below. Notation for probability that capital P denotes probability. They usually use capital letters to denote specific events and then P parentheses A denotes the probability of event A occurring. A probability model we will have our first introduction to probability now, and this will continue on through the next few chapters. So this is the list of the possible outcomes of the probability experiment and each outcome's probability. The first one says that the probability of A is a value that needs to be between 0 and 1, and it can include 0, and it can include 1. And the other one is going to be the sum of all the probabilities is equal to 1. Three approaches to finding probabilities result in a value between 0 and 1. The first is relative frequency approach of probabilities. This is where you're going to conduct or observe a procedure and count the number of times event A occurs. And so to do that, you would find the probability by the number of times it occurs over the number of trials of the experiment. The second one that we have is the classical approach to probability. This requires equally likely outcomes. If a procedure has n different simple events that are equally likely and if event A occurs in s different ways, we would say the probability of A can be found by taking the number of ways that something occurs and dividing by all those different simple events. So this would be along the lines of rolling a dice or picking a card or things along those lines. The third one we have is subjective probabilities. P of A is the probability of event A is estimated and it is estimated by using knowledge of the relevant circumstances. So this idea of subjective probability doesn't get used very often just because it is an estimation with previous knowledge. So the definition below that is the law of large numbers. This says that as a procedure is repeated again and again, the relative frequency probability of an event tends to approach the actual probability. The next example that we have says determine which approach is used to finding the probabilities and then find the probability. So the first one on here says, in a recent year, there was about 3 million skydiving jumps, and 21 of them resulted in death. Find the probability of dying while making a skydiving jump. So, 
first thing says determine which approach is used. And since we have actual numbers and we were able to observe this and count them, this would be our relative frequency approach. So relative frequency probability. And in order to calculate this, we will say the probability of, and we'll say skydiving death, would be the total number of trials would go in the denominator, which would be that 3 million. And then the numerator would be the observations of that event. And so for this one, it's talking about skydiving deaths, and there was 21. So dividing 21 divided by 3 million on your calculator, you're going to get an unusual answer. It actually is going to say 7e and then negative 6. This will not be a correct answer. Do not leave it in this form when you answer an, a quiz question or homework question or exam question. You need to rewrite this in the correct notation. So what this means, this E, this exponential is what that stands for, is times 10. So this is 7 times 10 raised to the negative 6 power. Um, to rewrite this from scientific notation into that standard form, you take your decimal place and you're going to have to move it six times to the left. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. And that would be the new place for your, your decimal point. This is going to be zeros that go in these spaces. So there will be one, two, three, four, five zeros and then a seven. Usually for our course, we don't leave our answers in scientific notation and they will ask you to write them in standard form. And so we would arrive at this. And again, if it asks you to round to four decimal places or three decimal places, make sure you follow the directions on rounding. Part B says find the probability of rolling an even number on a fair Dice. So the first thing is on this one, notice that there are no numbers. We didn't actually sit there and roll this dice to see what we landed on. So since we're not using any kind of observations or anything on those lines, this is called a classical probability approach. But we know enough about this to figure out rolling an even number what that probability would be. So we know that there are a total of six different sides on that dice. And so that would be in our denominator. And then thinking about the number of even numbers that we have, well, that would be two, four, or six. So there is a total of three. So reduce your fraction and you would arrive at one half or you can also write this as a decimal. Again, usually on my open mouth it will state how to leave your answers, either as a fraction or a decimal. The last one that we have on here says, what is the probability that the next dollar bill you spend was previously spent by Katy Perry? So first of all, there is no data given, and this is different for everybody. If you had just seen her at the store, or if you don't even live anywhere near where she does, it's going to be different. So we have no data. You're going to make an educated guess. So no data, we need to make a guess. And so that means that this is that subjective probability. So you can select anything you want for the probability that the next dollar bill you spent was previously spent by Katy Perry. So we'll say dollar previously spent by, and I'll just put KP for Katy Perry. And you can put almost any type of number in here. Keep in mind that probabilities have to be between zero and one. You can include zero and you can include one. So you can definitely put zero there. If you want to put something different, I cannot mark you off on this. So you could put 
0.000478, any number that you would like, but again, that number needs to be between 0 and 1, including 0 and including 1, for it to be correct. The next definition we have here is the complement of an event. Let A denote an event, then A bar, there's a line above that, is the complement of event A. This is all outcomes in which event A does not occur. You will also sometimes see this as A with a little C, as almost like an exponent. So the next example we have says, in a recent year, there was about 3 million skydiving jumps and 21 of them resulted in death. Find the probability of the complement of the event. So what that would be is the probability of not dying when making a skydiving jump. So the probability of not dying from skydiving jump And so that complement would be taking that 3 million, subtracting away the 21 people that did pass away, and the total number of people that did do a skydiving jump and survived would be the 2,999,979 people. So to find this probability, our denominator would still be that 3 million since those are the total number of skydiving jumps that we have, the numerator would be the 299, 2,999,979 people that survived. Working this out on your calculator, you arrive at 0 0.999993. And one of the things that you will notice if you go back and look at part A in the previous example, if you were to add up this decimal and the decimal of the people of skydiving deaths, that probability, you would get a total of 1. And that's shown down here in the next part. So the probability of complement events can also be expressed as the probability of the complement of A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. And you can see that by looking at part A up above. And so the 1 minus 0 0.00007, which was the probability of dying while making a skydiving jump, would equal the 0. probability of not dying, which is that complement. The next example right below this says the probability of owning a four bedroom home is 0.183. What is the probability of not owning a four bedroom home? So the probability of not owning a four bedroom home would be equal to one minus the probability of owning a four bedroom home which would be 1 minus 0.183, which works out to be 0 0.817. Again, remember, probabilities always need to be a value between 0 and 1, including 0, and it can include 1. Next, it says, if under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is very small, and the observed event occurs significantly less than or significantly greater than what we would typically expect, then that assumption, we can conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. So the next thing that we have on here is significantly high numbers of successes and significantly low numbers of successes. So this would be for the significantly high, this is going to be the probability of x or more and the sig significantly low number of successes would be the probability of x or less. And that magic cutoff number for us is going to be any value that is going to be less than or equal to 0 0.05. So having a probability of x or more 
being super small, which by definition for us is going to be less than or equal to 0 0.05, then we can say that it is a significantly high number of successes. Likewise, if the probability of x or less is also less than or equal to 0 0.05, then we can say a significant low number of successes. Right underneath this, we have actual odds against and actual odds in favor and then payoff odds, so our different odds definitions, which are good to know for your trip to Las Vegas. So actual odds against is an event A occurring are the ratio, and it's the complement to the actual event, and again, using the probabilities of those. It's so usually expressed in the form of A to B, um, with the colon or with the word two, where A and B are integers, so a reduced ratio. And then we also have actual odds in favor. This is the event A occurring or the ratio. You'll see it's the flip of what we had up above, which is the reciprocal of the actual odds against that event. And then we also have payoff odds against event A occurring is the ratio of net profit if you win to the amount you bet, so net profit to the amount bet. So on the next page we have an example dealing with odds and so this one says if you bet five dollars on the number 13 in roulette your probability of winning is one out of 39 but the payoff odds are given by the casino as being 35 to 1. Find the actual odds against the outcome at 13. So the probability of actually rolling a 13 is going to be 1 out of 39 as stated. And the probability of not rolling a 13, so not 13, would be 38 divided by 39 using that idea of complements. And so actual odds against 13 is what it's asking for us to do. So actual odds against 13 is going to be the probability of not 13 to the probability of 13, which is going to be, and another way to write this would be as a fraction, and writing this is 38 over 39 over 1 over 39, which would simplify to 38 over 1, and then rewriting it with that colon. It have 38 to 1. Next section says 4.2. This is the addition rule and the multiplication rule. We have a lot of rules in chapter 4. So these are the first two that we'll talk about. This section discusses the probability that event A or event B occur and the probability that event A and event B occur. So we'll be using these connective words of or and and. In the previous section, we only considered simple events, but in this section, we consider compound events. So this is going to be more than one thing occurring. So compound events is an event combining two or more simple events. So we have what the diagrams are below are called Venn diagrams. And so if you notice, there's different shading here going on. And let's look at the one to the right first. That part in the middle is where both A and B are occurring. So for this, this would be the probability or the area of A and B. That's going to be our connective word here and what it shows. Likewise, that first Venn diagram is shaded for all of A and all of B and also where they're both occurring. And so by definition, that's going to be A or B. So the word or in mathematics for statistics is a little bit different than it is in English. 
a lot of times if you think about this as you want a hamburger and a hot dog, that means both. So that follows along with that Venn diagram, that second picture on the right. But the word or, a lot of times if you were to say I want a hamburger or a hot dog, that means you just want one or the other. But for math, it's going to be one or the other or that middle part, which means both. So we have an example right below this. This one says a paint store has nine different colors of paint, yellow, blue, red, green, orange, pink, white, tan, and lavender. All of these are starting with a different letter, so that way we don't have to write everything out. You could just use those first letters to kind of symbolize those colors. And it says, let event one be selecting blue, red, white, and pink. Let event two be selecting blue, yellow, white, green, and tan. Part A says to draw a Venn diagram for the paint colors. So a Venn diagram is going to have a box around everything. And then inside is going to be two circles. And the reason why is because we have event one and event two. If you notice, there is a little bit of overlap here. Both of them have blue and white in those events. So that means that we are going to have an overlap. And those two circles that we have for the events are going to overlap. So draw two circles. I'm going to call this first one event number one and the second one event number two. So since blue and white occur in both of them, that's going to go in that middle section. And I'm going to go ahead and put a B for blue and a W for white. And then event one has a few other colors that are not in event two. That's red and pink. So those are going to go in the circle of one that does not include two. So I'm going to put an R for red and a P for pink. Likewise, event two, blue and white are already in there. And the colors that are not included are yellow, green, and tan. And so those are going in that circle that is not part of one, but is for two. And then if you notice, we didn't actually include all of the colors in event one and event two. The colors that we didn't include were orange and lavender. And since those are not in event one or event two, those go out here, L and O, orange and lavender, for our sample space. So part A says find the probability of event one occurring. So event one, so event number one, if you notice event one has a total of four colors out of a total of nine. So that probability is four ninths. I'm going to leave it as a fraction for right now. You could definitely express this as a decimal. Part B says find the probability of event two occurring. Event two has five different colors divided by nine. Part C says find the probability of event one or event two occurring. So probability of event number one or event number two occurring. So if we were to count all of these looking at our Venn diagram, we have red, pink, blue, white, yellow, green, and tan. So that's a total one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different colors. And again, out of a total of nine. Now, why does it not work? to add together these two. If I add together those two fractions, I would have nine out of nine, which would be one. Why is that not correct? The reason why is because blue and white are in both event one and event two, but they should only be counted once. And if you don't look at that Venn diagram or take that part of it into consideration, you would double count blue and white, thus causing that answer to be incorrect. So it says that down below. The next rule that we have is the addition rule. And that says for any two events, A and B, the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. The next example says a guidance counselor at a middle school collected the following information regarding the employment status of married couples within his school boundaries. 
So you can see the number of children under 18 years old and then who worked. You'll also notice that there are total columns here and they're not always given to you. Sometimes you have to calculate those values yourself. So part A says, what is the probability that only the husband works or only the wife works? So probability only H or only W. And so if you look at your totals, you'll see that the total, total number of people that were surveyed is 1,700. So that would go in our denominator. So then with the numerator, we would have only the husband or only the wife. So only the husband would be 425 and only the wife would be 126. And so those numbers need to go in our numerator and be added together. So there's a total of 425 plus 126 that are that number that have only the husband or only the wife working. And then dividing that by the 1,700. For probability, let's go ahead and round four decimal places. That's going to be very standard for us. Probabilities are usually rounded four decimal places unless otherwise stated. So the probability that only the husband works or only the wife works is 0 0.3241. Part B says, what is the probability that for a married couple selected at random, the couple has no children or only the husband works? So this is going to be the probability of no kids or only husband works, so only each. So again, denominator would still be that 1,700. It's our sample that we had. And then if we look at this, we're going to go ahead and this time we're going to look at no kids. So the total people that have no kids are going to be the 788 or only the husband works which is 425. Now if you look at this, this one doesn't work the same. And the reason why is because we double counted families where they have no children under 18 years old and only the husband works. So we first added up this column here to get 788. And then we added up this row to get the 425. And if you notice, you double counted that 172. So in order to do this, you can look at it a bunch of different ways. So as long as you get the correct answer, I'm going to take that 788, which was that total from that column in the zero kids. I'm going to add together 79 and 174, which would be the remaining people that have only the husband working, but have one child under 18 or two or more. So adding those together and then dividing by the 1700, we get 0 0.6124. So next we have contingency tables or two-way tables. This relates categories of data, row variables and column variables. And then next we have disjoint events or mutually exclusive. Make sure to know both of these definitions because they do get both used for the course. This is where two events A and B have no outcomes in common. So if you see your Venn diagram there, A and B have no overlapping area. Thus, the probability of A and B, since it has no overlap, would be zero. So the next example that we have says a store has six different equally likely colors of paint. Yellow, blue, red, green, orange, and pink. Let event one be selecting green or orange paint, and event two is selecting pink paint. Again, these colors all have a different starting letter, so that way we can use that as an abbreviation. So if you notice, this time with our two events, we have no overlap. So part A says to draw a Venn diagram. So I'm going to draw my sample space around it. 
but this time since there's nothing in common with the two, I'm just going to have event number one and event number two. And event one was green and orange, event two is pink. And then the colors that we did not include would be yellow, blue, and red. So on this, part B says, find the probability of event one occurring. So the probability of event number one is going to be, there's two things there, green and orange. So we're gonna have two out of the total, which would be count all the colors, would be six. And we can simplify this to one third, or you can divide it and get the point three, 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 three. Part C says find the probability of event one or event two occurring. So the probability of event number one or event number two. So total that we have here is still six colors so that would go in my denominator. Probability of event one occurring, there's two things, plus the one from event two, and likewise, you could just literally count those three things, which is three over six, or which simplifies to one half or 0.5. The next thing that we have listed here is complement events and the addition rule. So if you have the probability of A or A complement, which is gonna to equal to the probability of A plus the probability of A complement, minus that part that they have in common because of double counting, but you realize that this is equal to zero. This is just gonna be the probability of A plus the probability of A complement. So you could have also thought about this when you did that last problem. The next thing that we have is a struggle for many students, and this is conditional probability. It's denoted P for a probability of F given E, and that straight vertical line right here represents the word given. And so this is, it is the probability that event occurs, F occurs, given that event E has already occurred. So example down below, so suppose a single dice is rolled. What is the probability that the die comes up with a three? So single dice is rolled, that means that we have numbers would be one, two, three, four, five, or six. So the probability that it comes up with three would be, well, there's only one of those. And so it's one out of six, and that would be the probability. That's what we did in the very beginning of this chapter. Now part B is going to extend upon this. It says, now we are told that the outcome will be an odd number. What is the probability that the dice will come up a three? So since we know it's odd, that means that we have one, three or five. Those are the only numbers that it could come up with. So this is going to be the probability of rolling a three given, so we're given some additional information, it's an odd number. So if you look again, this time we only have one three, so it's going to be one, but this time our sample size is only three different numbers, so one third. So if you notice that probability of it occurring with that given information, knowing more about what's going on, this time for this problem is knowing that it was an odd number and restricting that sample size, that allowed the probability to increase. One third is larger than one six. So you can see that written down here with the notice. Conditional probabilities reduce the size of the sample space. So right below that, we have Conditional probability rule says if A and B are two events, then the probability of B given A is equal to probability of A and B all over the probability of A. You can also do this as the number of ways of A and B both occurring divided by the number of ways of A. The next example says... The following data represents the number of speeding tickets issued to individuals in the past year and the gender of the individual that they, rep that they identify with. Determine the following probabilities based on the results of the survey. Female, male, and total are given 0, 1, 2, 
three, and then total are also given. Part A says, what is the probability that a randomly selected individual was issued a ticket last year given the individual is female? So the probability that they were issued zero tickets, so I'll put down zero tickets, given that straight up and down line, they are female. And we have that formula right up above this. This is going to be the number of people that have zero tickets and are female, so both of those, divided by the number of people that are in what is given since that is what reduces our sample space. And so for this one, it's the number of people that are female. And so zero tickets and female would be a total of 97. All over the total number of females that we have is 115. I'm gonna go ahead and divide this on my calculator in round four decimal places. We have 0.8435. Part B says, what is the probability that a randomly selected individual is female given the individual has not been issued a ticket in the past year? So this would be the probability the person is female given zero tickets. And so this is going to be the number of people that are female, identify with being female, and zero tickets, divided by the number of people, and it's always what is given, which is going to be that they have zero tickets. And so looking at our table here, we have the number of people that are female and zero tickets is still 97. But this time, it's not given that they're female. It's given that they have zero tickets. And given that they have zero tickets would be that 168. So dividing 97 by 168 and rounding four decimal places, we get 0 0.5774. Get another reminder that probability can be zero, it can be one, but it also can be any value between zero and one. Part C says, what is the probability that a randomly selected individual is male given the individual has been issued only one speeding ticket in the past year? So this would be that they are male given one speeding ticket. And so where is the number of people that are male and one ticket, one speeding ticket, all over the number of people that only have one ticket. So they only have one speeding ticket. So this time we are not looking at females we're we'll look at the males with one speeding ticket, which is a total of seven. And then all over the number of people that only have one ticket, which is 21. So this simplifies to a third or 0.3333. So the reason why we I put number signs there and not piece for probability is because I have whole numbers and I'm not dealing with probabilities. You could definitely have converted those to probabilities and dealt with them then. It would have reduced and you would have gotten the same value there. But let's go ahead and look at the next example, which would require us to use that probability idea a little bit more. So this one says, according to the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics, 0.15% of deaths in the U.S. are 25 to 34-year-olds whose cause of death is cancer. In addition, 1.71% of all of those who die are 25 to 34 years old. What is the probability that a randomly selected death is the result of cancer if the individual is known to have been 25 to 34 years old? 
So if you notice the difference here is that the numbers are given as percents and they're not given as these whole numbers and counting values. And these percents is also a way to think about probability, but probability would be not expressed as a percentage, but as a decimal form of that percent. And so for this, it's asking for what is the probability that a randomly selected death is a result of cancer? So probability death from cancer given they are 25 to 34 years old. And why do we use that word given when it doesn't literally say given? It does say known. And a lot of times with word problems, they will use something that means those same things as given. And known is something that would mean that you are given it. You're, it's known that this is true. So in order to do this, we use those formulas again, but instead of using those number signs, I'm going to put a P for probability. And so this is going to be death from cancer, and they're 25 to 34 years old. All divided by probability that they died and they are 25 to 34 years old. So looking at the numbers that were given to us up above, the first part says that 0.15% of deaths in the U.S. are 25 to 34 years old whose cause of death is cancer. So that would be death caused by cancer and they're 25 to 34 years old. But I need to express this as a decimal. So this would be zero point, and again, moving that decimal point two spaces to the left, 0, 0, 0015. divided by the probability that they died and they were 25 to 34 years old, which we can see in here says 1.71% of all of those who die are between that age. And so this, again, rewriting this as a decimal, is going to be 0 0.0171, where if you divide this out, you get 0 0.0877. The next rule that we have is the multiplication rule. The probability that two events, A and B, both occur is the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given A. This is just taking that um, conditional probability formula that we had up above and rearranging it a little bit to be written a little different and having that probability of A and B written first. Then we also have independent and dependent events. So independent events is the probability that one event occurs in no way affects the probability of the other event incurring. And then dependent events is going to be the probability of one event occurs influences the likelihood of the other event occurring. So the next example we have says determine whether the events E and F are independent or dependent and justify your answer. So part A says E is a speeding on the freeway and F is being pulled over by a police officer. Well, you're probably pulled over by the police officer because you were speeding. So we will say that this is dependent. And justifying my answer, I would say something along those lines and say that you getting pulled over is probably a result of you speeding. Whereas part B, E says you get a high score on the statistics exam, and F is the Dodgers win a baseball game. And these are going to be independent. And so a lot of times people believe in that superstition idea of special things helping you win or things along those lines. However, one has no effect on the other. And so these will be independent events. The next formula that we have here is the multiplication rule, but this is for independent events. So you can only use this if it's known that the events are independent. So if A and B are independent, then the probability of A and B is just going to be the probability of A times the probability of B. And so in, we have an example right below this. 
And that says, according to the National Vital Statistics Report, 20.1% of all pregnancies result in a weight gain in excess of 40 pounds for a singleton birth. In addition, 495 of all pregnancies result in the birth of a baby girl. Assuming gender and weight gain are independent, so it tells us, what is the probability that a randomly selected pregnancy results in a girl and a weight gain in excess of 40 pounds. So a girl and a weight gain of more than 40 pounds. So in order to do this, it's asking for us to find the probability of having a girl, so I'll put down girl, and a weight gain, so I'll put WG for weight gain, in excess, so greater than 40 pounds. And since these are independent events, like it says, we can look at the formula that's listed right up above, which just says with that word connective and. It's the probability of having a girl times the probability of having a weight gain in excess of 40 pounds. And so the probability of having a girl is 49.5%, so expressing that as a decimal. And the probability of having a weight gain in excess of 40 pounds is 20.1%, and expressing that as a decimal also is 0 0.201. Multiplying these two values together, we get 0 0.0995. The next thing that we have is sampling with replacements and sampling without replacements. So sampling with replacements, selections are going to be independent events. So that means that you take maybe a sock out of a drawer or a M&M out of a bag, something along those lines, and then you're going to replace it and then select another. Um, versus sampling without replacements, these are going to be dependent events because if you take out an M&M and then you eat it, your sample space now changed and the, cha the probability of selecting something next is different than the first round of selecting that first M&M. So when sampling without replacements and the sample size is no more than 5% of this sample of the population, treat the selections as being independent, even though they're actually dependent. So it's a special thing that you can do. The example right below that says, assume that three adults are randomly selected without replacements from, and it's 247,436,830 adults in the United States, and also assume that 10% of adults in the United States use drugs. Find the probability that there are three selected adults that use drugs. And so we have to do the probability that all three use drugs. is going to be the probability that the first person uses drugs times the probability the second person uses drugs times the probability that the third person uses drugs also. Well, we know that 10% of adults in the United States use drugs. So the probability that first person using drugs is 0.10. The second person using drugs would also be 0.10. And the third person using drugs would also be 0.10. So multiplying these all together, we get 0 0.001.